Hey folks, welcome to Assorted Goods. I'm Dan Felton. Thank you for joining me this episode as we take another curious look at the world around us. I hope you're doing well out there. In this episode, we're diving into the topic of our favorite substance, the foundation of everything from the way we drink liquids to an unlimited variety of cheap products that we use and throw away to people's actual faces and bodies. All right, the last one isn't literal, but I'm of course talking about plastic, the cheap flimsy crap that makes the world go round, but it's also destroying the world too. And plastic is literally everywhere on earth, and now we're finding it in our own bodies. All right, maybe that joke I just made was actually accurate after all, but figuring out what the current state of plastic is here on planet Earth, what it's doing to us and our world, and why nothing is actually being changed along the way. All that coming up here on Assorted Goods. And remember, if you like the show, hit that subscribe button on whichever app you are listening on, or simply just tell a friend about it. Or don't, and keep all the nuggets of information you learn to yourself, and then talk about them like you've learned it all on your own. You know, whatever floats your boat. All right, let's just get going and start the show. Assorted Goods is produced by Disinformed Media in association with Verboten Productions. Promotional support comes from the Always Up Network and DeanBlundell.com. At the end of March, a study was published in the journal Environment International, where researchers for the first time have found microplastics in human blood. Human blood! And that's simply part of a developing trend right now. Airborne microplastics are showing up in people's lungs and in the placentas of newborn babies and their mothers. Nothing like a family tradition. Microplastics are also being found in plant life, in the food we eat, in air, rainwater, the oceans. They are seriously everywhere. This is a plastic planet we're living on now. We're about halfway to becoming real life action figures walking around the universe's biggest dollhouse. Oh, I can't wait to have some go-go gadget limbs. Think of the awesome potential. Now, all of this is on top of the fact that our landfills, rivers, and the oceans themselves are positively overwhelmed with plastic, and that each and every day, more and more empty Coke bottles, straws, and used dildos float their way out into the environment, break down, enter the water cycle, remember fourth grade science now, and in turn end up on our dinner plates and in our bodies. That's right, you've got used dildo in your body. Ah, we really are all connected, man. Now, you may remember that in the first months of the COVID pandemic that these stories came out about how the environment was healing because of everyone being locked down, social distancing being in effect, air pollution got better, Greenhouse gas emissions were way down. Yay, problem solved. All it took was a globally deadly virus that kept us all inside to reduce the effects we have on the planet. But, well, it really wasn't all that simple because at the same time that we were setting a record for how few people were driving, we were also massively increasing the use of plastic products, personal protective equipment like masks and gloves. And then there's COVID testing kits. Not to mention all the disposable products that were used to reduce the spread of COVID, meaning more single-use plastics. Those all went way, 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 way up. Add in the fact that in some countries, COVID lockdowns kept recycling plants from running, and we've robbed Peter to pay Paul, reducing air pollution, sure, but making our garbage problem much worse. Right now, it's estimated that globally we produce over 380 million tons of plastic each and every year, which I know it's a number so big that it's like me asking you to imagine how many grains of sand there are on a beach or how many different cryptocurrencies there are to invest in. But here's a rapid fire round of statistics for you. About 50% of that 380 million tons are single use plastics and around eight to 10 million tons of that plastic ends up in our oceans every year. Estimations right now point to there being somewhere between 15 and 50 trillion pieces of plastic in the oceans right now, with over a million creatures being killed by plastic every year in the oceans. The next remake of The Little Mermaid is going to be really dark. I get this. According to a study from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, by 2050, there would be, by weight, more plastic in the ocean 
than fish. Now, that's been a little bit disputed because the numbers used for that study are uncertain. But the thing is, all these numbers are a little uncertain. Why? Because the ocean is freaking huge. And because there is so much plastic being used all over the globe, it's really difficult to pinpoint these statistics exactly. It's really hard to nail down precise numbers because we simply can't see all the crap that is both floating on the surface of the oceans and whooshing around in the currents below. But we do know there's a lot. There's going to be a lot more, and it's all very, 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 very bad for everyone. Consider the Great Pacific Ocean Garbage Patch, which, according to the Ocean Cleanup Project, is estimated to be about 1.6 million square kilometers, or about three times the size of France, or twice the size of Texas, since we know how much Texas loves to brag about how giant their stupid state is. And the Great Pacific Patch is actually only one of five trash-based lost continents of Atlantis floating around our oceans. So the outlook? It's not great so far. Then there's the fact that over 90% of all plastic used doesn't get recycled at all, and that most recycling programs don't use a big chunk of what we do recycle, and that for decades, a big piece of recycling programs consisted of packing it all into a container and shipping it to another part of the world where it mostly ended up as trash and then back in the oceans. <laughs> yeah, so it's a solid system we've got going here. So when you're constantly worrying about sorting your recycling because the city workers refuse to take it if it isn't sorted perfectly, just remember, it's not doing much good anyways. Recycling programs have, in reality, always been a way to shift the onus of garbage and plastic onto the consumer and divert the problem away from the central culprits, the manufacturers of these products. But we will get back to that as we go along here. And then there's this last tidbit that is just so much fun. Every piece of plastic ever made, ever still exists, and will easily outlive both you and me. Hooray! Plastic can take a thousand years to break down. And here's a thought experiment. If Leonardo da Vinci was pounding a Coke Zero while painting the Mona Lisa, that bottle would still be out there floating around. Da Vinci was, of course, big on zero sugar, as we all know. So then how the hell did we get here? Living on a planet that now has the chemical makeup quickly approaching Barbie doll level. Well, let's do a speed run of the history of plastic, or I'll use a classic podcasting cliche for you. <clears throat> In order to understand the current plastic crisis, we've got to go back, way back, to when plastic was first invented. I'll insert an ad for car insurance or a mattress and assorted goods is almost a real show. But the word plastic means pliable and easily shaped, which makes sense. But plastic itself, as we know it at least, is made up of polymers, which are long chains of molecules. Plastic is a synthetic polymer. And although you can make synthetic polymers from more natural substances, the plastic we are surrounded with are most commonly made up of petroleum and fossil fuels thanks to their abundance of carbon atoms. Yeah, plastic and oil are part of the same planet Earth loving family of crap. The first synthetic polymer was created in 1869 by a dude named John Wesley Hyatt, who accepted a challenge to find a substitute for ivory. It was too much trouble to slaughter elephants into extinction, so a better way had to be found. Then, in 1907, Leo Bakeland invented Bakelite, which, although it sounds like a brand of low-THC weed, was actually the first fully synthetic polymer, meaning that it had no natural ingredients in it. Humanity had found a way to make pure, unnatural crap, but boy, was it flexible and durable and lightweight. Bakelite was also good as an insulator, which was useful for the drastic rise in electricity and wiring spreading around North America. Plastic's rise to prominence coincided with a few developments in society at the same time, increasing the demand for the product. But what Bakelite really did was change the mindset behind these substances. One article from Scientific American I found said that people stopped trying to find what they needed in nature and started imagining ways to rearrange nature to be more useful. Stupid nature, making it so hard to have all this great stuff. In the next couple of decades, all kinds of new synthetic materials were created. Styrofoam, nylon, Teflon, Kevlar, and big companies moved in to take advantage. 
like DuPont, for example, original trademarkers of nylon and styrofoam. Styrofoam, by the way, which never breaks down at all. Good stuff. And, you know, DuPont's a real mom and pop business, considering how little of those two things we've used over the years. Now, World War II had a lot to do with plastic becoming the substance of the consumer-based future, with production of plastic quadrupling between 1939 and 1945, from 213 million pounds to 818 million. But once the war was over, production couldn't just stop. Oh, Oh, no, 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 that would be bad for business. So companies like DuPont, in fact, mainly DuPont, but they push for a wide range of products made with these new synthetic materials to be sold to the now booming post-war middle class of folks with newly built homes, good jobs, and an insatiable boredom that can only be cured by spending money on shiny objects that fill the gaping holes in our souls. And thus... Plastic became the backbone of a global consumer economy. And since dealing with waste and environmental effects are nothing but a net loss for the big companies of the plastic world, nothing was done to get ahead of the waste problem. It's like a kid pushing a mess they made under the couch. The big business of petrochemicals, aka plastics, pretty much looked the other way while finding the next thing to sell, and thus here we are. But this is the crux of it all, though. We're simply paying the debts we've been incurring for over a century now. Our global economic system, our consumption-based culture, our mindsets of toss it and forget it have led to this. Practical land masses of trash floating around the oceans. Landfills filled with shit that will last a thousand years. And now, babies being born with plastic in their bodies. So, how did we get here? Simply put, because we never gave a shit. And I'm not here to preach. My recycling bin, as I'm writing this, is filled with plastic, mostly Coke Starlight bottles. Dear God, why is this sugary crap that tastes like Coca-Cola mixed with cough syrup at first now a beloved member of my junk food indulgences? Ugh. But the problem is what these plastics are doing to us. Just for a minute, close your eyes and imagine with me, if you will. Unless you're driving. Don't do that then. But... Just imagine eating a pile of plastic bags. Mm, Think how chewy they'd be. They don't break down. So how would you know when to swallow if they never change consistency? And then the stomach pains. Oh, Lord, the stomach pains. But okay, well, right now, researchers estimate that humans are eating about five grams of plastic a week or the equivalent of about a credit card worth of plastic. Mm, Nom, 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 nom. Over the course of a lifetime, Researchers estimate that we ingest about 40 pounds of plastic. And these numbers vary depending on where you live, for one, but also based on your dietary habits. Drinking more bottled water? Yep, more plastic for you. According to a study from the University of Victoria, an average American adult ingests between 126 and 142 particles of microplastics every day and inhales another 132 to 170 particles. You're damned if you eat, and you're damned if you breathe. And even more scary is the fact that these studies only examined about 15% of the average person's caloric intake. Meaning, yes, the numbers are probably much, in fact, are much, much, much higher. Move over credit cards. It's time for the main course of eating your TV remote. Mmm, yummy. Now, of course, you might be thinking, I'm not eating plastic. I would know if I was eating plastic. Well, as much as every piece of plastic ever made still exists, it does still break down. It just breaks down into these tiny little particles that we call microplastics, which are under five millimeters in size and therefore get into absolutely everything with ease. So yes, you aren't eating a plastic bag in full. But say you're eating a piece of fish, and when it was still fluttering around in the ocean, that fish was taking in tiny bits of broken down plastic that then got into its body and ended up being mixed into your fish and chips. And now the researchers come around to realizing that the circle of life has a hitchhiker on it in a century of broken down plastic bits. We eat it, we poop it out, it goes back into our water filtration systems, it finds its way back into the environment, and so on. Little bits of microplastic really get a front row seat to everything that goes on on this planet. 
And this is what we're dealing with. A century of petrochemical production of plastics of all kinds, a rapid consumption-based culture that is always buying and tossing things away, myself included, absolutely no effective waste management strategies, and then the environment breaking this crap down into tiny microparticles that in turn end up in our air, water, food, killing species of all kinds, and settling all snugly into our blood, our lungs, and hell, even our newborns. Researchers are finding microplastics in some of the most remote regions of the planet, too. Nowhere is safe. So you can probably guess what this all means, right? What is this direct injection of plastic into every part of our natural world doing to us? Well, it's not making us lightweight, flexible, and extra durable, that's for damn sure. Human history is littered with examples of things that we shrugged at that ended up causing serious health effects that had to be managed later on like the dangers of smoking, or lead in paint, or lead in gasoline, or lead in water pipes. Basically, lead turned out to be a bad idea in general, but plastic appears to be the thing that we are already behind on addressing, and are maybe only starting now to notice that it's causing a lot of harm to people. I'm no expert, but babies with plastic in them, you know, it doesn't sound like the best thing ever. Plastics are toxic chemicals. There's a reason why we're never advised as kids to chow down on that toy fire truck when you're done playing with it for an extra bit of nutrition. The chemicals in plastic when they enter our bodies are, of course, not good for us. Chemical elements of these artificial polymers are harmful to our bodies, whether it be things like lead, oh shit, there it is again, or cadmium or mercury, all found in plastics and all are toxic or elements like DEHP, another toxic carcinogen, or most commonly BPA, which is a central part of plastic packaging like water bottles. All of these are toxic to the human body. BPA in particular, when broken down and then ingested by people, like when you reuse a plastic water bottle a bunch of times, this little particle can cause hormonal disruptions in our endocrine system. Not good. Microplastics have also been proven to cause cell damage, and when they get into our organs, cause inflammation and oxidative stress in our tissues. Again, all of it not good. If it isn't pretty obvious on the surface, toxic chemicals ending up in our bloodstreams and organs isn't exactly great for us, and in turn, it causes damage to our organs. Also, again, fill it in for me, folks, not good. These effects can lead to things like cancers, obviously, toxic chemicals and all. Also, hormonal disruption knocks off our body's natural functions. And in terms of babies being born with microplastic particles in them, we should expect developmental delays in those unlucky little ones too. Plastic being everywhere in our environment and now in our bodies is making us sicker, weaker, and very likely similar to the effects of lead paint and all that over the decades. It's all on track to make us probably a little bit dumber too. Just what we needed. So then, what the hell are we doing about all of this? I mean, when we found out how bad smoking was for us and for cancer rates, you know, we ran public service ads, we started up anti-smoking campaigns, and a cultural shift took place that led us to change our outlook on smoking and in turn our own habits. We phased out lead paint and sell unleaded gasoline now. We recognized there were issues and long-term health effects that have their own cost on our healthcare system it has an economic effect as well. And in turn of those things, we adapted. So why not the same thing with plastic? When researching this topic, I actually saw the suggestion that the chemical byproducts of plastic being seen as harmful to humans was actually being brought up as early as the 1960s and 70s, and yet nothing's changed. Well, if you've listened to Assorted Goods before, you know that this is where I set you up for the mid-episode break and then lure you in into meeting me on the other side for more. That being said, this is where we're going to take our mid-episode break and hear a couple of messages from other independent podcasters who would love for you to give them a listen and add their shows to your rotation as well. And when Assorted Goods comes back, why nothing is being done about our plastic problem and who's been getting in the way of meaningful change? Stick around. Assorted Goods will be right back. Hey there, this is Frankie Sparks. And this is Scott Eisenberg. We're married. 
and we have a podcast called Shoot the Flick. Every week, Scott and I introduce each other to a new movie the other one has never seen. We talk about it, give our thoughts on it, and also share some behind-the-scenes fun facts. We want you guys to come along and enjoy the movies with us. Check us out on Instagram and Twitter at Shoot the Flick and check out our weekly episodes every single Wednesday on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and pretty much anywhere else you can find a podcast. Come and listen to us now as Frankie and I Shoot, shoot the, the Flick! Welcome to another episode of the Hammer Down Sales and Productivity Podcast, where we're going to make you productive and not busy. Addressing the needs of business owners and planting the seed for a secure future. Do you want your business to grow and prosper without sacrificing the freedom to live the lifestyle you want? Do you want to build a company that you can cash out and sell one day so you can retire comfortably or go after the next big idea? So ask yourself the following questions. Do I want to become far more successful and productive? Do I want to grow my business to the next level? Do I want a business to work for me or me to work for it? Do I want to develop a dominating team of employees? And do I want a business that is both fun and profitable? Remember, action, attitude, and approach. And we're here to help you with that. All right, welcome back. So after a century of plastic becoming the most beloved chemical compound in the world, and now realizing that it is everywhere around us, even settling into our internal organs, we're left with the question of why nothing has seemingly been done about all of this. And I'm not so much talking about the fact that we're finding microplastics in our own bodies now. That research is still new. So I'll bend on that point a little bit, I guess. But I I mean, come on. Plastic pollution and garbage as a whole isn't a new issue that we're dealing with, and any expert probably could have told us a long time ago that this would happen. Plastic bags being found floating in the ocean has been traced back over six decades, and in 1969, at a conference for Dow Chemical, one of the biggest producers of plastic products, one of their own executives pointed out that the durability of these revolutionary new plastic products would also create a waste problem, and that, at the time, His solution would just be to burn it all, which of course would release crazy amounts of toxic chemicals into the air. But more importantly to the petrochemical industry, it would have been too damn expensive to deal with, of course. Now get this. Remember that culturally iconic ad with the indigenous man who sheds a single tear at the sight of all the garbage on the beautiful land around him? It's from way back, decades ago. Well, that ad was actually created by Keep America Beautiful, a nonprofit organization that was funded by some of the biggest waste producers in the world, like Coca-Cola and Dixie Cup. And their philosophy was exactly what we mentioned in the first half of the episode, that the responsibility of all of this trash is on you, the regular person, not them, the producers of it all. Keep America Beautiful ran the tagline in these campaigns, quote, people cause pollution, people can stop it, implying that the people in this instance are you and me, and not Dow Chemical or Coca-Cola. I mean, that's like if I went around burning down houses in my neighborhood and then launched a campaign saying, fire prevention is on you as a homeowner. Or, if you want to think about it, the classic defense of guns in America that Americans love to use. You know, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Shifting the onus away from the industry and onto the individual. Now, Keep America Beautiful is still in action today and still running big recycling campaigns and cleanup projects with volunteers and, of course, feel-good public relations moments. And all of that is great, sure, but it's really spotlighting a small piece of this giant issue and then hiding the much larger problems in the shadows. These days, Keep America Beautiful has a board of directors with members from Keurig, Dr. Pepper, Mars Wrigley, Coca-Cola and Pepsi, and Philip Morris cigarettes. And okay, just for a second here, let's take a moment to appreciate the fact that Coke and Pepsi are on the same team here, as long as that team is deflecting any responsibility for creating massive amounts of waste. Then there's the American Chemistry Council, which according to their own bio, quote, represents the leading companies in the business of chemistry 
Our companies make the products that make modern life possible. ACC members have made a voluntary commitment to uphold the highest standards for protecting health, safety, and the environment. ACC is committed to improved environmental health and safety performance through the world-class Responsible Care Initiative, participation in which is a condition of ACC membership. Wow, I did that in one take. Way to go. But the American Chemistry Council is known as the representative body for most of the major petrochemical producers in the world. And when I was researching this whole episode, I kept stumbling into pieces with their name attached that indicated that plastic waste isn't that big of a deal and that advanced recycling techniques were being developed and are pretty much the solution to all of our problems. Stop asking questions. Shut up now. Go away. Bye. The Responsible Care Initiative, by the way, is filled with the usual corporate speak. You know, the kind of we're committed to doing blah, 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 blah. We promise and we swear we'll do a whole bunch. It's really your fault anyways, but okay. And you can actually on their website for the American Chemistry Council under the Responsible Care Initiative portion, you can buy a Responsible Care Initiative flag with a Caring Hands logo on it for the nice price of $100. Always be selling. So, okay, we know how this works because it's the usual tale. Big industry finds a way to make money at a mind numbing pace. Their industry causes big problems, and it begins to be clear that people are getting hurt. That big industry then does everything in their power to avoid those facts being known. They fund organizations to lie with a layer of legitimacy, publish journalistic articles made to spread their own BS, and of course, nothing changes. And when it comes to the global problem of plastic pollution, big petrochemical companies and companies that use plastics as a central piece of their products have worked really, really hard to avoid responsibility or accountability. Really is a story as old as time itself. Last year, an Exxon lobbyist was caught on tape saying that the company has actively been working to combat any government regulations on plastics and that Exxon has been working with guess who? the American Chemistry Council, to run disruption. And one of their most common modes of disruption is by conceding that, well, studies need to be done on the effects of plastics before any laws can be passed, which is really just an attempt at delaying any legislation for as many years as they can while these studies are carried out. But now we're also living in a world where awareness about climate change and its effects are becoming more common, although goddamn slowly, of course. But There is beginning to be a conscious shift away from fossil fuels as an energy source. But remember, big oil has always had a secondary option, plastic production. And in addition to attempting to disrupt meaningful legislation on fossil fuels through political lobbying, aka buying politicians, how is that seemingly allowed all the time looking at you, America? But now there has been a shift that is awfully similar to what the cigarette companies did when there was the whole cultural shift against smoking. Cigarette companies, when their solid consumer bases in the Western world began to shrink thanks to years of public health messaging, discouraging cigarettes, well, they decided to take a lot of their business overseas and even began promoting and selling cigarettes to kids. Seriously, there were no laws stopping them in other countries. And as we all know, you got to start them young. Oil companies now have a similar philosophy, with governments and companies looking into shifting towards renewable energies going green and reducing plastic waste exports to other nations, well, that's going to be a hit to the old bottom line. All hail the bottom line. And so, new opportunities must be explored. Those opportunities? Well, they include the influencing of government policy in Africa. A 2020 report from the New York Times found that big oil lobbyists have been actively working to overturn a plastic bag ban that was passed in Kenya. And that, guess who, the American Chemistry Council had been lobbying to disrupt regulations on plastic exports all across North America. Yeah, get this, Big Oil apparently had their muddy little hands in NATO trade negotiations, including at one point opposing any sort of junk food labels being placed on food products because they were worried that it would reduce the number of purchases of companies' products that use, yeah, you guessed it, plastic packaging. So not only is it microplastics that are showing up everywhere, it's also the industry itself. They're in everything. 
they're in the walls. Now, earlier I was saying that a big part of recycling programs for a long time was to just pack it all up and then ship it overseas to places like China and let them deal with it. So you did all that sorting for nothing. Now, there are stories, by the way, that the way that the plastic would then be sorted when it arrived in places like China was, in some situations, by simply dumping it into a river and then picking out the good plastics, the ones that could be used, and then letting the rest just wash down river. It's almost like a philosophy on life. Just let all the trash wash down river. However, in 2017, China instituted Operation National Sword, which was aimed to put a stop to China importing the waste of other countries. And so nations like America and Canada needed new places to send our trash, places like Kenya. Unsurprisingly, the amount of plastic waste shipped to Africa quadrupled between 2018 and 2019. How did that happen? All the while, petrochemical lobbying groups have continued to try to influence policy to allow looser regulations when it comes to trade policies and the exporting of plastics. The industry is also aiming to increase plastic production in the coming decades to make up for the potential reduction in crude oil demand. And we all know that they will continue to fund nonprofit organizations and political lobbyists who will aim to delay and disrupt anything meaningful being done that goes against their interests, all the while our health and environment will continue to take the kick in the ass. Now, there's this one article from Vox that I will be sure to highlight after this episode drops, and of course, will be in the episode source list. But this article has some astounding numbers about the effects the plastics industry has on the world in economic terms as well for the number worshippers out there. Now get this, in America, the petrochemical industry receives about $12 billion in government subsidies a year and pays about $2 billion in taxes. Sweet deal. Now, estimations of the total cost of plastic production, environmental side effects, and long-term healthcare expenses put that number at about $1,000 per ton of plastic or about $350 billion a year, which, by the way, is considered an external cost to this massive industry, meaning that we're talking about stuff that the industry has no part in paying for. They just produce what causes these problems and cash in and walk away. So then what kinds of solutions do we have on the table here? This is always where we end up here on Assorted Goods, is trying to figure out some good stuff. Something good, please, I hope. Well, of course, there have been numerous international agreements and targets, such as the Paris Climate Accord, which aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reliance on oil as an energy source, and plastic pollution. But these agreements are basically handshakes and hopes for the best. Many nations in these agreements are falling short of their targets. And if they fail, what's really going to happen to any of them? Who will hold the largest plastic waste producers on Earth accountable if they simply shrug at meeting these already pretty weak targets that they've agreed to. So this was the part of the episode where I was really hoping for some solid solutions. You know, a, a little light at the end of the plastic-filled tunnel. Now, some of the solutions are the simple ones, the ones you and I have had drilled into our heads for years now. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Bring a reusable straw everywhere you go. Bring your own bags to the grocery store, all that good stuff. And yes, all of us can play an active role in working through this problem. Our own behaviors do matter a lot, but in reality, the responsibility of regular people is very, very small when held up to the Goliath that is the petrochemical industry and the oil industry. And okay, honestly, here's my problem. Most of the solutions of new ideas that I came across here when trying to find something for the end of this episode were at best half-assed solutions. For example, a big idea being pushed right now is to use plastics in construction materials. The idea being that you can use recycled plastic as a substitute for some of the chemical elements in things like asphalt or even as a substitute for wood. And all of that is an all right idea, considering that the boom of construction worldwide has led to shortages of ingredients of things like sand, which are needed for construction and all that. And, you know, finding other uses for recycled materials is a good thing. Sure. But I'm going to level with you here, folks. And I'm at a bit of a loss, really, because frankly, I am genuinely demoralized 
Because when trying to find viable solutions for the plastic problem, everything we've been talking about here this episode, what I ran into again instead, again and again and again and again, was Goliath. You know who's a big believer in the use of plastics as a construction material substitute? Plastic companies. You know how many articles I found that stated that Hell, sustainable technologies and energy sources are actually more wasteful than plastics and oil. And how just about each time I looked into who was making these suggestions, I found my way back to some sort of foundation that was, yep, you know it, funded by Shell or Exxon or the Council for Plastic Holy Shits. The most viable solution we have, really, honestly, is to flat out stop creating plastic and using it for everything. The solution is absolutely not to just make more and use it in more places forever. Plastic rules. And I know it's a naive idea to suddenly imagine changing a major part of our world on the fly. But in terms of what we've talked about, that's kind of the only option we have. I'm, I'm really not kidding you here. So many things you find when searching for new ideas to combat plastic pollution lead you to the same types of articles, which say things like, yeah, plastic pollution is bad and there's a lot of it. And yeah, we only recycle like 9% of it. But here's an idea. Let's use that 9% to make more stuff. There are hardly any truly viable ideas as to how we can recycle more than 9% of all the plastic that gets made or what to do with the plastic we already have floating around our oceans. Just ideas of why plastic is great, why it cannot be beat, and why, if anything, alternatives are far worse. So we got to keep it with the plastics. And remember earlier when I was saying that the whole petrochemical industry is looking to increase production of plastics because they see there being a bit of a reduction in the use of oil for energy needs in the future? Well, their goal is absolutely and directly to create new plastics, not to repurpose old ones. If you actually dig even a little bit into what they're actually saying when they are projecting their future, they are talking about new plastics specifically, not repurposing recycled ones. So don't get that twisted. And this point, this moment of the script where I am right now, it was right about when reality struck me or beat me over the head with a big piece of plastic. We live in a world dominated by this industry, so much so that it's extraordinarily difficult to even research real solutions because so much of the information out there is a backdoor suggestion from the plastics industry its goddamn self. Now take the idea of advanced recycling. It's a real term. Sounds good, doesn't it? Well, what is it? It's actually a flash term used to describe a chemical process where non-reusable plastic waste gets broken down with chemicals and heat in order to be disposed of. Chemicals and heat. That sounds interesting. If you're wondering, yeah, environmental activists have called this idea essentially burning trash. It's just a nicer way of putting it, I guess. Industry experts say it's actually returning plastic back to its chemical elements. Here, where I live in the province of Ontario, here in Canada, the use of advanced recycling has been embraced by our premier, Doug Ford. A premier, by the way, is essentially a state senator for you Americans. Oh, and we also only have one of them, unlike the weird system you have. So what he says pretty much goes. Ford, by the way, once put the oil industry on notice and demanded that they lower gas prices by 10 whole cents. He said that four years ago and has promised that he's still planning on getting around to it while also embracing an oil industry approved recycling overhaul. Great stuff. If you Google the term advanced recycling, you wanna know what the first result is? It's from the American Chemistry Council. On that same page one of Google, by the way, nobody looks past page one anyways, but there's an article from Forbes magazine. Oh, okay, okay, Forbes, solid publication. I get a lot of research from them, sounds good. The article's titled, quote, Breakthroughs in Advanced Plastic Recycling Will Help Deliver on Sustainability Goals. That sounds great. It's just what we want. New recycling, sustainability goals. Works for us perfectly. The author of the article, quote, contributor, the Baker Institute. All right, I'm thinking Baker Institute. Sounds like a real thing. So 
here I go, Googling the Baker Institute, supported in part by Rice University in Texas. All right. Academic institution. Sounds good. Please, God. A little digging finds what? The funding support for the Baker Institute via Rice University, which includes Shell Oil Company, Chevron, Exxon Mobil. Oh, fuck. And this is about where I lost any decent feeling in my soul anymore. This truly is plastic world, oil world, whatever. I am a regular dude making a podcast yelling in my living room right now about an issue and realizing that not only is this maybe the most influential industry in the history of the planet Earth, but they have so much control that even truth itself is almost in their hands completely and therefore really so is any change. You want a solution? We should have stopped making plastic shit dead cold like four decades ago. And if you want these companies to care... I don't know, string up the lobbyists and enact laws that charge each of these companies every goddamn dollar in external costs they create, slash their subsidies to zero, and jack their tax rate to, I don't know, 90%, and let their shareholders cry about it. I, of course, say all of that, acting as though the people who make our laws aren't on the same team as them, too, and knowing full well that a major portion of the general population would hear me say that and call me any number of names. Then maybe I can just try right now to appeal to you, just you, whoever's listening, my valued listener, I love you. And let me say just this. I get that this is another one of those issues so big that our brains just can't even wrap around the problem. And maybe recycling is a pain and doesn't seem to do anything. It doesn't. So then maybe I can appeal to something more basic, self-preservation or selfishness in general. Hear me out. Because the problem which for the course of my 30 years here on earth has always been something that is happening to animals and oceans and forests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of sight, far away, really. Well, now, based on the things we've talked about this episode, it's happening directly to us. It's in our bodies. It's in our blood. It's in our babies. For the love of God, what else is there to say? Oil companies, petrochemical producers are enemy number one and should be treated with the same anger and hostility that gets harnessed and weaponized by our politicians and directed at your neighbors. What do you see right now every day when you wake up and you log into social media or you read the news or whatever you do? You see nothing but people at each other's throats over culture war issues. Every minute of every day, it's always some other group's fault for everything. Meanwhile, I cannot find one goddamn article about real solutions to an active and developing public health nightmare that isn't looped back to an oil company. So hey, reduce, reuse, recycle all you can. But when it comes time to cast a ballot in the future, maybe we should all consider asking our candidates what they're planning to do about the toxic infusion of plastic garbage that has found its way into our air, our water, our dinner plates, and well, the dinner itself too, and not by our own choice a toxic chemical that is infecting our bodies, our kids, and our planet, and then see if any of them give a shit. All right, that's it for this episode of Assorted Goods. Thank you for listening. Seriously, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I didn't drive you nuts at the end. If you want to follow the show on the socials, you can follow me and Assorted Goods on Twitter and Instagram. The handle on both platforms is at Disinformed Dan. I'm sure the oil companies would agree. You can also visit the website, disinformed.ca, where you can find show notes for each episode, which also includes the sources used for the information in the episode. And if you want to support Assorted Goods, all I ask is that you hit the subscribe button on whichever app you're choosing to listen on. And of course, just to tell a friend about the show, send them a link, get them on board. And if you want to email the show, you can reach me through the contact page on disinformed.ca or just make it easy and email me directly at dan at disinformed.ca. And folks, if you can find me reliable, uncorrupted information on plastic solutions, please send them to me. They are hard to find, and my frustration boiled over at this point, I admit. The music for this episode was created and produced by my talented brother, David Felton. Thank you, brother, as always. And credit for the information used in this episode goes to the journalists, academics, writers, editors, and everyone involved who isn't bought or influenced by the oil industry in keeping people like me informed so I can provide people like you with a quality show. Thank you again for listening. Take care of each other out there. 
And I will catch you next time here on Assorted Goods.